Good afternoon, everybody. This is Steve Wilson from uh, the State Water Survey at the University of Illinois. Um, we're here today for a webinar, uh, Well Care 101, What You Need to Know to Protect Your Family. Um, this is a series of webcasts that we do. Um, we do one a month, uh, typically as part of our private well class program, which I want to mention is uh, sponsored, funded, and supported by the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, and I'll explain more about them in a little bit. And the funding they receive comes from USEPA to um, really, this is a source water protection grant. It's meant to help well owners understand their role being a well owner so that they can um, both protect their health and also protect uh, the groundwater that they use. Um, so, we will move on. Um, these webinars are also available for credit for sanitarians um, if they're a member of NEHA or their state accepts NEHA credit. And so um, one disclaimer here is that we do put this webinar on regularly. You can see the dates down in the bottom right corner. Um, most accreditation is two years. Uh, as an example, I showed this uh, from before. If, if, you've take, if your accreditation expires on uh, 9-30-18, then you wouldn't be eligible to take this again until 9, uh, after 9-30-20. So, um, and there's also Illinois LEHP credit, and we've become a uh, certified CEU provider for the state of Illinois um, because of our close relationship with all the county health departments and, and the folks we work with. Uh, the water survey where I work is um, a quasi-state agency. We provide a lot of um, uh, support uh, to uh, groundwater users and to the counties and the state health department as well. So um, in your handout, information that's down on your go to webinar screen uh, tab there's a handouts tab and uh, these are the things we can provide you if you're interested in those um, a copy of the slide deck as a PDF uh, the certificate of attendance and then um, the information you need to submit and uh, use our email address which is info private well class uh, to get to that and um, a little bit about today's webinar uh, it is part, as I mentioned, part of a national program supported uh, and implemented through RCAP. RCAP is actually the boots on the ground part of our program, and we're the um, more the internet-based and based in Champaign, Illinois version. Um, they have staff in every state. They have uh, private well experts who help well owners one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they do training uh, for both sanitarians, stakeholders, and well owners. And uh, so, uh, if you want more information about RCAP and the role they play in this program, uh, they're really the lead, and uh, we're just a, a partner. Um, so, uh, and we are recording this. We record every one of our webinars. So even though there are other webinars in the past, like the last one was on 9-18-2018 uh, with the same title, the one difference in each webinar are the questions that you all ask us in advance. Um, we try to answer as many of those as we can as part of the webinar at the end. And so um, it's of interest to you as a well owner, especially, to go through those webinars that are recorded. And if you need to, uh, for all the well, well owner 101 webinars, or well care 101, skip to the questions, and they're going to be different every time. And so um, uh, they're really useful. They're questions from actual well owners and sanitarians and other stakeholders. And so um, we're going to answer a number of those today uh, that you asked uh, many of you just yesterday. So we've been scrambling. Um, but at the end, also, if you have a question that comes up today during our uh, webinar that you'd like answered, you do have a place on the GoToWebinar uh, menu where there's a chat box or a question box. Uh, Katie uh, Buckley, who's part of our team, uh, is monitoring that, and she'll create a list of questions that we'll do at the end that are from questions you all give us today. Um, all right. So a little bit about RCAP. I mentioned they're all over the country. These are the names they go by. They're, these are the six uh, nonprofits that make up the RCAP network, our partnership. And uh, you may, so you may know them by Communities Unlimited or RCAC or the Midwest Assistance Program, depending on where you live. But um, if you need contact with any of those folks, you can uh, look them up or you can contact us and we'll get you in touch with someone. Each region has a private well lead, a person that I work with and we work with. And they also have staff, and uh, uh, they may have three or four staff, one in, in different states who are working on private well, uh, uh, pro this program. So um, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, there's a lot of things I can't get to today 
that they do in the field um, that uh, you know we can certainly get you the contact information. So today we want to talk about the basics of well care. Um, the, the idea is you know how to keep your well and your drinking water safe and what are some maintenance best practices. Um, we certainly did get a lot of questions and we'll answer some of those today, not all of them obviously. Um, I do want to mention uh, I'm a groundwater hydrologist. Uh, I spent a lot of my career doing research on groundwater in Illinois. Uh, Katie Buckley is our outreach specialist. She's fielding the questions uh, and does a lot of outreach for us. Um, and uh, she's uh, here today and, and keeps me straight. As well as uh, Dan Webb is here. He's the head of our public service lab, which um, he'll be answering any of the water quality related questions. And you'll see that at the end because a number of you ask questions about issues that they're Dan's forte. Um, so the water survey, uh, most of you have never heard of it. And even people in Illinois don't know what it is, but we've been around since 1895, and that's important because uh, the water survey was created. It's a sister agency to a state geological survey, which every state has a state geological survey. Illinois also has a water survey that's the same type of agency. Um, we're the only one in the country, and um, we have groundwater, surface water, atmospheric sciences, and chemistry groups. So we have a public service lab that until 2006 or so, any well owner in Illinois could get their water tested for inorganics and metals for free. Um, we house the state's well logs. We have a database with um, over 500,000 well logs in it. So that gives us the information we need to help folks who have issues. We had a well owner come in yesterday and we looked up their log and got them a copy of it and, and some of those sorts of things. But we've been around a long time, well over 100 years. And it's a, what's cool about that is the history we have and the information that's available to us. Um, I, you know, one of uh, our staff was looking through our well records for Pena, Illinois, and came across this graph um, or this image. We have tons of this type of information. You know, the water survey was formed because of typhoid and cholera outbreaks in the 1890s. And here in uh, 1916, um, these are all cases of typhoid in Pena, Illinois, and it was eventually traced to the Pena Ice Cream Company. But you can see here the kind of information uh, that's available, um, you know, the kind of work that was done for public health protection even uh, back then trying to figure out what was going on and, and how water plays a role. So the thing to remember if you're a well owner is that um, they're not regulated. It's really up to you as the owner to be sure your water is safe to drink. You're really, uh, the best way to put it is you're the water operator for a very, very small water system where your community water uh, supply has a licensed operator who tests your well, um, make sure you have pressure all the time and all those things, you're in charge of doing that. And the thing you need to remember is, you know, water can look clean. It doesn't mean it is clean. It can look dirty and that may mean it's, uh, it, it looks dirty, but it tastes fine and it's safe. You can't go by whether it's colorless, odorless, or has no taste. The only way to really know is to test. And so, you know, that's one of the messages you'll hear a lot uh, from every health professional and anyone in the groundwater uh, well business is that you should test your well annually, and that's to ensure that your well is safe to, the uh, water is safe to drink. And so the difference is I grew up on an old dug well. It was 14 feet deep. Um, when it rained really hard, our water was cloudy for days, which basically says that there was surface water getting in our well, so it was not safe. Um, but that's the way I grew up, and my dad always swore our well water was better than city water because it didn't have chemicals in it like city water does. Well, that's obviously the opposite of what's the truth. Um, I pay $40, $50 a month now living on a community water supply uh, in a town of about 150000 And that's the, that money spread out among, you know, the, uh, say, 40,000 or 50,000 homes that are here um, goes to pay for maintenance, all the infrastructure to make sure when I turn on a faucet, I have water. I know it's been tested every three months. Um, they know what's in our water. They treat it to make sure it's safe. And uh, they do all the legwork so that I can just turn on a tap. And uh, that's your responsibility as a well owner. Uh, and, you know, it's not to be intimidating. Um, if you do things the right way, um, it's actually a lot of people prefer to be on their own well. And, uh, you know, you maintain things and you sample properly and you ensure it's safe. Um, groundwater can be a, a great source of, uh, for a private water supply. Um, some things about wells. So um, the things you need to consider really are how deep your well is. One, it's generally better the deeper your well is, but that is need to caveat that and I'll explain that more when we go through well types um, because sometimes it really matters where your water is coming from and what I mean there is if you have a sand and gravel well it's got a screen 
uh, so the bottom five feet may be a screen. The rest of it's a solid casing. The only place water can come in your well is in that five feet at the bottom. So if that well is 150 feet deep, but you know the water is coming in your sand and gravel well from 145 to 150 feet below land surface. That's great. That means it's protected from surface contamination. Um, other well types, though, like the dug well I grew up on, or uh, a sand point that's hammered in the ground from you know the hardware store, they may only be 20 or 30 feet deep and uh, much more susceptible to contamination uh, from the surface, as well as for bedrock wells. Um, a 600-foot bedrock well may only have you know 40 feet of casing or 50 feet of casing. The bedrock itself acts as the open hole for the rest of that. And so, you know, generally it's better if it's deeper. If it's got enough casing, that means it's it's harder for surface contaminants to get down the well. You know, location on the landscape, are you upgrading or downgrading of a potential source? Or is your well in a floodplain where sometimes it gets flooded and the water can overtop the well? All those sorts of things. And the same way with groundwater flow direction. A lot of times you don't know that unless there's been work done uh, by a consulting firm or a state agency where they've looked at the, the uh, groundwater in that area. Um, but if you know the flow direction, it gives you an idea of where you need to be concerned about potential sources. Because there's just a lot of places in the country where uh, groundwater or where surface water can get into the ground, either if it's in a karst area um, or if there's shallow sands and it can infiltrate really quickly. Um, those areas are more vulnerable just because of the nature of the geology they have. And then lastly, this area surrounding your well. You know, there should be nothing around your well. We see wells in basements, um, in garages, under garages, um, in the middle of a feedlot. Those are not great places to put a well um, or to have a well. Um, so the idea is there should be nothing around your well. There shouldn't be any trees, any of those things that can cause a problem or create a way for uh, something from the surface. You know, roots from a tree can um, pinch a PVC casing and crack it as they grow, um, or they can get around the annulus or on the outside of the casing and create a pathway so that there's uh, things can infiltrate down the ground. So all those things you need to think about. And again, the best thing to do is to have nothing near your well, have it sealed properly and, and all of those best practices. So the first thing I want to mention is most well problems are because the well is old or it was drilled and put in before the current construction code. Now, not every state has construction codes. There's two that don't. But uh, in general, every state does. And um, it's old wells that were grandfathered in. Some are in pits. If you're in a northern area where you're subject to freezing and a frost line, wells used to be put in pits so that the pipes could be ran into the house below the frost line. And today, you know, we have a pitless adapters for those areas so that you don't have those pits, they, they're a safety hazard. And I'll show you some examples. Um, and also, the water can pond around the well, and eventually it's going to work its way uh, down the annulus into your, into your well. Uh, here's three examples. Obviously, the picture uh, on the upper left, this is from the Washington State Department of Ecology. They have a blog where they put information up about uh, wells. They're the state agency in Washington State that regulates drillers and licensing for drillers and well construction code. Um, you know, the woman who uh, died here um, stepped on this plywood and it gave way and broke. She fell through. But if you look at the way this little, this is a little building, we believe, um, and it had a concrete block covering that hole so you had access, um, just a thin piece of plywood covering it. But you've got a broom over there in the corner and a siphon or a funnel up there and that you know, that gray stuff looks like it might be um, from insulation. Uh, mice, rats, anything that gets in that building can fall in that well. It's just really poorly constructed. And the one on the upper right speaks for itself. That's a dead goat. And, uh, you know, they had taken an old brick well. You can see the bricks down there at the bottom. And they took a piece of uh, concrete pipe and put it vertically for the upper few feet or whatever. But it was low enough that this coat fell in it. And... Uh, yeah, that's just, you know, that ruins your well. Uh, you sure don't want to drink that. And the one on the bottom, uh, Walt Kelly uh, and I were involved in a study sampling a bunch of uh, large diameter wells, both bored and, and hand dug. And this is just an example of everything you don't want to do. It's on a slope, 
so the the field that's just above that uh, is in corn you know every other year so they're putting pesticides and nitrate on that um, this is actually in a cattle pasture so that's why those boards or those posts are worn so much the cattle are rubbing so they're also standing around that and and you know creating other problems um, it's covered by plywood and tin or two by eights and tin and uh, some concrete blocks to hold it all down I uh, guarantee you snakes, rats, other things can get in there and do and fall in. Uh, it's just not a safe water supply. And so these are all, you know, things you don't want to have for your well. Um, so what should you do? Bring those up to code if you can. You're not required to, but the best thing to do would be to talk to someone at your state agency and find out what the code is or talk to a driller or contractor. And, um, you know, if it's, if it's in a pit and it's a regular, you know, say a four inch or six inch casing, extend it up to the surface, fill that pit, uh, that pit with uh, clay grout, and, um, you know, take care of making sure that it's safe uh, as a safe well. So uh, the same thing for abandoned wells. Um, one of the problems we have around the country is there are a lot of these old hand dug wells or other wells that were put in place a long time ago. Somebody buys a house out in the country, they put in a brand new well, they're going to use the old well for, for irrigating their their garden or something like that and they don't do that in the end it sits there not only are they a safety hazard uh, they're also a source of contamination so if you have an abandoned well on your property the best thing and what you're legally required to do in most states is actually fill it in now there's no enforcement of that so it doesn't happen a lot um, but as a well owner um, if someone trespasses on your property and falls in that old abandoned well and gets hurt or worse yet killed um, you're likely going to be responsible and um, you don't want, and you know, somebody dumps stuff in there, it can contaminate the aquifer and all those sorts of things. So it's just uh, best practice is to talk to a contractor. Your um, actually, your soil water conservation district has, in some states, have programs where they cost share abandoning wells, and you should look into that um, because it's uh, they're just they're not worth having around. Um, and you know, here's why: these were all abandoned wells. There's a horse. This, again, the two pictures are from the Wisconsin or Wisconsin, excuse me, the Washington State Department of Ecology from their blog. Uh, they pulled a horse out of a well, and, and this guy fell 45 feet into a well, and uh, they pulled him out, and he was fine. Now, that's pretty lucky. Um, you hear a lot of stories otherwise. And these uh, newspaper clippings are all from the 90s. Um, Illinois used to have a groundwater education coordinator, and he provided these to me before he left. Um, the third one down is the toddler trapped in Texas, you know, that's Jessica McClure. Those of you that are old enough remember when that was carried live on CNN for like 18 hours while they rescued her in a, out of an old well. And, um, you know, it really, it was an interesting thing to see that on television because, you know, most of these stories are in the local paper. And so the people in Galesburg didn't know what happened in Springfield. But, uh, you know, people get killed because of these old wells and you know, fall in them. And, you know, some people who may have just disappeared, you find them years later in an old well. Uh, things like that. So as far as basic well care, um, you know, we certainly recommend that you should use a licensed driller or pump installer contractor when uh, working on your well. Um, some folks have some wherewithal to do uh, repair work or that sort of thing. But, um, you know, c constructing a well is not a trivial thing. It depends on the state what your rules are. But like in Illinois, you're allowed still to drill your own well on your own property. You can't do it for anybody else. You can't take any money for it. Um, those sorts of things. But if you don't know what you're doing, um, that's why you see people like in some of the sandy areas who go buy a Sandpoint kit, basically, because it saves them money. Well, they've got a piece of pipe that's only 20 feet in the ground, and they're in a sandy area where they're, you know, they're putting bug dust on their vegetables in their garden and doing other things, or there's livestock nearby. Uh, there's no way that water is going to be safe because it's too influenced by the surface. So, um, you know, the picture on the right here is a, a properly constructed uh, well with a good cap. Where those bolts are, that cap comes off, there's a rubber seal. And a lot of times that's what goes bad and people don't realize it. So if this area were prone to flooding, if that rubber seal's all brittle because of a hard winter or two and uh, not doing its job, then water can get in the well and that's when you see bacteria and E. coli problems. So uh, most states also have guides or rule books on those things. I encourage you to look at your uh, rules. Um, Minnesota's got a lot of great information available. I'll reference them several times today. Um, but, 
you know, you can find this information that's all online. And if you need help finding it, you can contact us and uh, we can help you do that too. So as far as the well site, again, here's another really nice looking well. It's got, uh, you know, uh, everything looks clean. It's probably pretty new. But uh, what you should do about your well cap, if it has a vent, uh, make sure the screen is on it and it's uh, solid. Uh, th there's a screen over the entire gap where that screen vent is supposed to be. Uh, make sure it's elevated like it's supposed to be. Most states have rules, either 12 inches or 18 inches or 24 inches above land surface. And that's to protect from the top of the well being over top during a flooding event. Um, but again, that goes to location. You should also have um, the ground sloped away from your well. This one doesn't do a good job of that. But um, the idea there is so when it rains, water's running away from the well and not ponding near it where it can start seeping in. Uh, again, the annulus is the area on the outside of the casing that would still be inside the borehole. So if you put in a six inch well, let's say this is a six inch uh, casing, um, the, the hole that they drilled to put that well in was probably seven and seven eighths or somewhere uh, in that vicinity. So there's an area between the well casing and the outside of the borehole you've drilled that you have to fill in and the driller is required to fill that in with grout usually uh, depending on the state and um, grout is a clay mixture that doesn't allow water to flow through it. You need to be sure you know, if the well's been constructed properly, then you wanna mound uh, dirt up around this so that uh, once everything gets back to normal and grass starts growing, water's running away from your well. Uh, this is just again an example uh, of what Minnesota does. Um, this is their setbacks requirements, but it's the idea it, the reason I'm showing you all, and I know, you know you're from multiple states, is just the things that can influence your well. And you may not realize all of the different things that can matter. And so, um, you know, some of them are just a little bit like, uh, I'll show you on the next slide, the bottom half of this. Uh, it says three feet there near the bottom. But, you know, I had a guy contact me once from New York who said he tested his uh, water, or hit, he tested his filter and it had algae in it. And I said, well, algae have to have sunlight to live. There's no way. I said, tell me about your property. Well, it turned out it was his lake house and as well as 10 feet from a lake. So guess what water he was pulling in from as well. He was pulling lake water in, including the algae, and it was getting in as well, So, or getting in his water system. So the, all those things matter. You need to understand if you're close to something that might be a source, that it's probably something you need to check and maybe test for. Um, and here's the bottom half of that. And they say three feet from a building, it seems like common sense or building overhang. That's so if you have a submersible pump or you need to pull something out of your well that the driller or contractor can set up over the well and actually do that. Um, I ran into a guy here in Illinois a long time ago. We went to measure the water level in his well as part of a project we were doing. And he said, well, you can't measure my well. Um, I put a building on top of my well uh, because I didn't have any other room. So he basically uh, cut his well off below grade and filled in and put a concrete pad over his well so that he could put a garage on his property. And, uh, you know, the first time he has any problems, and it actually had a submersible, submersible pump in it, which makes no sense because there's no way to get the pump out. There's no way to fix anything that goes wrong with it. There's no way to deal with the wiring if something happens. So when his well fails for any reason or his pump fails, um, he will be drilling a new well or getting rid of his garage. Uh, and so, you know, common sense needs to prevail for some of these things. And that's why we just show this, uh, you know, even an unused well, another well nearby, um, they can influence each other in some cases, uh, if, especially if it's two wells that are both being used, um, even for drawdown sake or the amount of water available, it could have an effect. So the other uh, thing that's important to understand about your home system is your septic system. Um, you know, there are more septic systems out there than there are private wells. Uh, just because there are some small towns where they have a centralized water system, but they don't have uh, centralized wastewater yet. And so um, these are a source of contamination if they're not maintained and they're not properly sited and uh, they're not built correctly, depending on the type of geology and all those things. Many states are now developing rules for that. And that's great because there's some places that you should not have a typical septic system, um, especially in the Northeast where the bedrock is shallow and close to the surface, these things can become a source of contamination really quickly. Um, but this is a typical system. This is a two partition tank. 
And the idea here is stuff comes from your house, from your shower, your toilet, your sink, and it, it lands in the first tank here and the solids fall to the bottom. Uh, the lighter, the less dense stuff floats on top, but then the water can work through. There's bacteria in here that are breaking down the material that's in there. And in the end, uh, it's the water that gets pushed through based on, you know, how much flow is going through there out through a perforated pipe system uh, so that it can go into a leach field where then it's absorbed and the soil can break it down further. This is a natural system and it works great on its own as long as you don't do things that you're not supposed to do. You shouldn't overload it. You shouldn't put things that don't belong like medicine, um, all those sorts of things. Um, but there's nothing you need to add or anything else if this is functioning properly. The one thing you have to do though is you have to um, pump the tank out of sol the solids out of your tank once in a while. And I have people tell me, well, I've never had to pump mine. Well, just wait, because at some point you're going to fill it up and it's going to plug your drain field and then um, you're going to have to start all over because you can't use or, or dig it all up, including, you know, your soil absorption field here, which is a real problem. So what you should do, um, you need to also maintain the area around your septic tank and drain field. You shouldn't put anything on top of it. You shouldn't have a road there. Uh, you know, soil compresses whenever there's a heavy load put on it. It should just be grass, no trees. Um, you know, there's people who make their entire living on uh, running pigs through uh, wastewater or septic line uh, to, to dig up or to uh, cut up the tree roots that are in there, and they do it again every other year because once they have a way in, um, you're not going to get them out. And so you shouldn't have any of that stuff near your uh, tank or drain field. And... Uh, most tanks, so they're all tanks have an inspection port and a manhole. You should make sure those are available, not uh, underground or whatever. We have people who call me and say, how do I find my septic tank? So not only have they not doing any maintenance on it, they don't even know where it's at. So um, the best thing you can do then is, you know, make sure that you are, you understand where your tank is, how big it is, um, where the flow goes, all those things. And um, as far as the flow into your tank, the bacteria in there are from our stomachs and they need time to break down things. And so you shouldn't have your sump pump or whirlpool or your softener backwash go into your septic tank. It's just an additional load that moves stuff through the system quicker and it doesn't give the bacteria time to do their job. So that's why it should only be wastewater. And you know, the recommendation from a lot of the, the wastewater folks is if you have a garbage disposal and you also have a septic system, you should have the, have the time uh, of when you pump your tank because those solids get into your septic system. Bacteria can't break down, you know, a, a huge piece of carrot or, you know, the top of a part of a celery, you know, whatever. Um, so you should not use a garbage disposal with a septic system at all. Um, and then obviously it makes sense. No man-made stuff, paints, pills. Uh, you know, you put bacteria work in your septic tank to break things down. You have extra amoxicillin or some other kind of uh, antibiotic, and you put it down the toilet just to get rid of it. Um, you're killing all the bacteria in your septic tank. So, you know, some of those things just don't make sense. Um, you should inspect your tank or have someone inspect it for you to measure the level of solids. When it gets to a certain point, it'll plug things up, and you don't want that to happen. And that's why you need to pump it on a regular schedule. Um, the EPA has some great information they developed through their wastewater program and, uh, and their septic smart program. And if you can see that URL at the top, it's just epa.gov slash septic. It's very easy to remember, but there's a ton of tools here, both for um, septic owners and for those who work with them, um, technical resources and all that stuff. But you go through this, there's a, uh, this slide is dated, obviously, this is from last year because um, it says septic smart week is uh, 2018 there, but it's always in September. And uh, there's a, a bunch of information I know we put out during that time. And I'm just going to go through, you know, over on the left side here under septic systems, there's a lot of uh, different things you can click on to learn how your system works and what you should do to maintain it and toolkits and all those sorts of things. Um, explains why it's an issue and what can happen. You know, here it shows the septic system. The little picture on the, on the right there shows a septic system on one side of the house and the well on the other. But if the groundwater flow direction is towards that well, and there's not enough time and you're pushing too much through it, you can have sorts of issues there. And it may be, um, we've seen cases where uh, folks have E. coli contamination and it's a direct link from their septic system to their well. And so, you know, that's kind of a problem. Um, and 
I just showed this one graph. It's the one I mentioned a second ago. Um, but there's a lot of good information in here. I encourage you to take a look if you have a septic system. And uh, you can learn a lot about um, what you should be doing uh, to properly maintain that. And then there's also, um, I'm not going to talk more about this, but if you're in an area where you can't put in a conventional septic system, there are um, advanced systems, aerobic systems, and things that work just like a wastewater treatment plant. And they're meant to break things down so that the material is harmless and can either be um, discharged or taken away periodically. And so um, you see this a lot where bedrock is near the surface. There's nowhere to put a tank. There's no drain field area. Um, bedrock doesn't, um, you know, water flows through bedrock through the cracks and fissures. It doesn't, uh, it's not like sand and gravel or the soil where it just percolates through all the little, uh, the, you know, the small soil materials. And so those are pathways. They're like pipe flow. They're conduits. You can have one sinkhole um, that you know, manure or other things can get into that can affect, affect the well half a mile away because that's the same crack or fissure that that well is pulling its water from. So, um, you know, in some cases, uh, a lot of states are taking more of an interest in on the septic side and requiring certain things depending on the geology. And uh, you can talk to your state agency or your state geological survey uh, to get information about what kind of geology you have and if it's a concern. And then there's um, webcasts they've done over the, the years on different things related to uh, wastewater treatment that uh, it's worth uh, taking a look at. So as far as testing, um, we recommend you test your well annually or anytime the well's been opened. And or if you notice that, uh, you know, there's all of a sudden your water tastes, looks, or smells different than it should. You know, groundwater is pretty consistent. If you have a really shallow well, um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, you're more beholden to the water table and shallow infiltration. But uh, any well that's in, you know, a, you know, an aquifer that's uh, fairly deep um, should be pretty consistent in water quality. At least that's what we typically find. So what do I test for? Well, every situation is different. Um, you need to understand how deep your well is, how much casing you have, what geologic formation the water is coming from, and if there are any known contaminants in an area. You know, we have areas where we know there's arsenic, so we certainly recommend in those areas that people test for arsenic as well. We have areas where we know there is no arsenic in an aquifer, so there's no reason to test for that. Um, your local or county health department is likely to know uh, those things, and so you should contact them or your state health department and get advice on what should I sample for. Um, also, uh, other folks may know, your neighbors, your driller, co-op extension, so in your county. Uh, so if you talk to all those people and say, hey, I want to get my well tested, what should I do? You may learn uh, things like, oh, well, you know, there might even be a testing program where you can get the cost uh, reduced or it's free if you willing to provide the sample and make it available, all those sorts of things. And then I mentioned before you sample for coliform and nitrate annually, not because col coliform itself isn't considered a threat, but it means there's a pathway into your well, and the same with nitrate. You know, nitrate is um, certainly bad for babies and pregnant uh, mothers um, because it can uh, disrupt uh, the blood oxygen levels in your uh, blood um, and your hemoglobin and stuff. Uh, and again, I'm not a health professional, which I'm making very clear. But um, they also indicate uh, that something from the surface is getting in your well, and that's why you test for them. Because coliform is not necessarily the bad bacteria. It's the indicator. It's E. coli uh, that usually causes health problems. So I just want to show a couple examples. You need to be inquisitive and look and see what your state or your county or your local health district or somebody else, some other agency in your state may have. This is Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. They've got this cool site they set up. They know they have a lot of uh, uranium and arsenic problems in their bedrock, and it's just a naturally occurring contaminant. And so the only way to know if you need to test for those is they've done a lot of testing in the state of Massachusetts, so they know where it's at. And so if you type in your address and you live in Massachusetts here, um, it will tell you whether you need to sample for arsenic, uranium, or both. And then there's even other information here uh, about uh, you know, certified labs and things like that. And they're not the only state doing this sort of thing. More and more states are providing materials. And this is Rhode Island right below Massachusetts. I show this because uh, the little circles on here are all where there used to be orchards. 
and they know there's arsenic. So arsenic was used as a pesticide for many, many years, and most of the soil in orchards uh, are contaminated with, with uh, arsenic, uh, some at very high levels. And whether that gets into the groundwater is another thing, but it's something certainly to be aware of and test for. And then the, the splotch in the middle, um, this is the thing I like to show about this, uh, beryllium is a regulated contaminant by the EPA, so it means it has health effects. Uh, communities have to make sure there's no beryllium in their water. Until I found this figure on Rhode Island's website, I had no idea beryllium was regulated and or that it had health effects. Um, but sure enough, there's natural occurring beryllium in Rhode Island. It's probably the only place I've ever seen it, uh, or at least it mentioned. I'm sure it exists in other places. Um, but if you're in that area, you should test for beryllium, and you should you can read up. If you just uh, go to EPA's website and look at uh, MCLs, which means maximum contaminant level, and put in beryllium or just find the entire list, you can search for it because that's a, a tough one to spell. Um, you can find what kind of health effects it has, and you know if you get your well tested, um, you can understand if you have that issue. It's probably very localized. We don't certainly see beryllium as a, a common contaminant in, in groundwater. And some states have even taken the next step They've created an online mapping tool like Wisconsin has. So they've contracted with um, the Center for Watershed Science and Education at um, Stevens Point uh, College uh, or University in Wisconsin. And the Wisconsin DNR has given them this data. And you can see I went over, uh, I clicked on the map and said, or up on the right side and said, display arsenic by county. And so what it shows me there is um, everything in green means it's, it's five or less, but there was a detection. Um, and then it gets worse from there, but the blue, the dark blue, uh, where it says none detected, that means the samples they've done there um, didn't have any arsenic, uh, at least not at detected, detectable levels, which is pretty low these days. But you can see around Green Bay, uh, there's three counties there where the average sample that they've done uh, is over 21, which the health standard for community water supply is 10. So I'm gonna caveat that all the time and say for a community water supply, the standard is this, and that's because the Safe Drinking Water Act says that community water supplies have to test and have to be sure that their water meets all these standards. You, as a well owner, um, can, can test, and those are what are considered uh, the surrogate for well owners to, you know, you want to stay below a value of like 10 for arsenic if you can, because it's considered more of a health risk. But there's no law that says you have to, uh, except in one or two uh, areas or at a property sale when they test, sometimes it's required uh, either by your lender or by an agency. So, but it's good to know uh, this sort of information is available. If I'm gonna move uh, to Wisconsin and uh, I have, you know, uh, this information, if I'm gonna buy a house that has a well on it, then I'm certainly gonna test it for arsenic if I'm in that area. Uh, you can, there's other contaminants you can search for through this. It's a really nice tool. And uh, we think there are gonna be a lot of these available uh, in the next few years from other states. Um, I believe Louisiana is working on one, uh, for instance. So what do we suggest? So we try to look at this from the perspective of nationally. You know, you have different things in different states. So obviously test for coliform and nitrate every year. They indicate that there's a pathway into your well, so you should never have high values for either. Uh, no high nitrate or uh, hits for coliform. And then um, if you haven't ever sampled your well, here's a list that we recommend. Um, it gives you a good um, overview of the chemistry of your water, whether your pH tells you whether your water is acidic or not, or uh, some of these other, uh, you know, alkalinity along uh, with pH and some other things tell you how corrosive your water might be, and that matters if you have lead pipes or copper pipes with lead um, solder, or if you have galvanized piping, uh, then uh, if your water is corrosive, it could uh, lead to some of those things leaching more readily. And so, um, but we always also recommend you contact your local or state health department and ask them what to test for. You know, they may tell you, well, you also need to test for beryllium because of where you live. And you don't know those things unless you've done some research to find out. So um, as far as getting it analyzed, you know, every state accredits labs uh, and there's a whole accreditation program through US EPA. And that's so that communities that have to meet certain health standards with their water have a place to take their lab or their samples that they know they're gonna provide good results. Um, also, some states have programs for private well sampling. Uh, 
you know, through extension, Texas, uh, Mississippi, uh, Virginia, there's a few others. And so, um, you know, may be able to find, uh, you know, a way to get your water, water initially analyzed at a, for, uh, less cost, that sort of thing. But if you talk to a lab, we tell labs all the time, we tell well owners, they should be, you should be able to give them detailed instructions, what to test for, how to store it, you know, how to preserve your sample, all those details so that when they bring a sample in, it still, you know, can get analyzed and it's going to give you a good result. And if a lab can't do that, I tell well owners, you should go find another lab because uh, they should be the experts and be able to tell you that. So, um, and when, if you feel weird about it or for some reason you're not satisfied, keep asking questions until you are um, because you want to be sure that when you're done, um, you've got a good sample, the results are trustworthy, all those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, the lab should provide all the bottles and everything you need. You know, our lab, the lab that Dan runs, um, is not accredited. It used to be, but the rules have become such that we can afford to really do that. We have the staffing. We use the EPA methods and all those things. And there's two or three of those university labs, I'll call them, around the country that, um, you know, we've got a good reputation. A lot of well owners come to us. Um, and, you know, there's, there's one in Virginia, there's one in Texas, at uh, Texas A&M, and uh, Virginia Tech, and then University of Illinois. So, um, you know, find those things out, and you do what you're comfortable doing. And, uh, you know, if you're uh, an accredited lab, the advantage there is you know they've had to meet certain criteria or they can't be accredited, and so they're, you know, they're, you're, you have less risk of finding a lab that isn't doing a good job. So as far as interpreting your results, there are websites out there and, and a lot of documentation available to tell you, well, here's the standard, here's what you need to do, you know, all those things. But um, no matter what, at the end, you should take your sample result to your local health department and ask for an answer from a health professional. Is there anything here I need to be concerned about? Um, you know, it's a good idea, or if you want to, you're inquisitive to use. I'm going to show you a tool that's really cool uh, that is online, but in the end, um, you should take it to a health department and to a sanitarian or a health or your doctor and ask them uh, if you should be concerned. And if you do find something, especially if it's really uh, unusual, no one else in the area has it, or uh, it's not some common contaminant like E. coli, um, you might want to resample. Sometimes uh, labs make mistakes or they may, you know, they, sometimes they, uh, there's just sometimes there's issues. There might have been something happened in handling or whatever. And if you do have bacteria, and you just did a coliform test, then you should have an E. coli test performed and find out if maybe you have E. coli in your well because you don't want to drink that. And you can boil it until you get your well chlorinated or disinfected uh, to get rid of that uh, as well. So this is the tool I mentioned. So this was developed by the state of New Hampshire, the Department of Environmental Services, uh, with, a, with funding from CDC. And so it's called the Be Well Informed tool. So you can Google this and find it, Be Well Informed New Hampshire. And at the very bottom there, it says enter your water test results. You can click on that. And uh, it, this was developed for residents of New Hampshire. So they have materials available um, that are New Hampshire centric, if you will. But um, anyone can use it. So it asks you what town you live in. You can put anonymous like I did up here in the upper left side, upper right side. But then I put in 15 uh, micrograms per liter of, of arsenic, which the standard is 10, right? That's p parts per billion. And so um, the cool thing about this is when you get a lab result, some labs report everything in parts per million. Some labs report things in different units. Some might use micrograms per liter, and others may use PPB, and those are the same thing. And so this particular tool has a drop-down so you can match what's on your water test. And that's important, and I'll tell you why. Um, for our class, the private well class, we've had well over 6,000, I guess close to 7,000 people take our class around the country. And this is, you know, you sign up for it and you get lessons delivered to you by email. We have a pretest with that and we ask people to convert from one unit to the other. As you know, your arsenic result shows this value, how much is that in PPBs? And only 27% of people get that question right. So uh, units are tricky and, uh, you know, most of us haven't done a lot of math since high school. So um, this is an advantage, I think, and it's really handy because they provided the typical units you're going to get your results in and it gives you an idea. So I put 15 in knowing that the standard's 10, and uh, here's what I got. I got a red X saying, you know, the, the drinking water contaminant limit is 0.01 milligrams per liter. It's converted for me. 15 micrograms per liter equals 0.015. So it's, you know, it's 
uh, it's over 10. Uh, and so um, they tell you there's two types of treatment that will remove arsenic. There's point of use for absorptive media, and there's point of use for reverse osmosis. And so it explains what those means. It gives you uh, links like to NSF, the National Sanitation Foundation. So if you're going to add treatment, you want to make sure you find treatment that matches the, the, the contaminant you have. And you should again talk to a health professional at this point um, to say, hey, what do I do? What are my options? And if they don't know, they can send you to someone who does. You can also contact us, um, and we will try to help you. So this is the bottom part of that page. Um, so it tells you what the health concerns are. And again, this is done by a state agency and funded by CDC. So to me, that's vetted and it's reliable. It's not someone trying to sell you something. It's, you know, there's no, uh, uh, it's objective information. And uh, that's, you know, critical. So the NSF down here near the bottom for treatment options, you want to find a treatment device that's either NSF ANSI standard 53 certified or NSF ANSI standard 58 certified. And those are for absorptive media or reverse osmosis. The 53s are typically, uh, they're the things, the cartridges that go on top of your sink. Um, and an RO unit typically goes under your sink, but then, and you even have a separate tap. And, you know, you can learn more about those by looking that stuff up. But, you know, there's, uh, let's say an RO unit costs $500, uh, but it's certified. It has the NSF stamp on it or uh, the gold seal from the Water Quality Association or, um, or it has a UL symbol on it. That means it's been tested and it actually works like it says it will. If it doesn't have any of those symbols, um, it may be, you know, some other company that's uh, not tested it. It's only $150, but you don't even know if it works, and there's no verification that uh, they have met any of those standards. So it's worth it, uh, since you're talking about your health, uh, to make sure that you get something that's been approved to treat the contaminant that you found. So as far as interpreting results, again, I want to just stress, that's just a tool. There are others out there. That's probably the best one, though, to be honest, um, that they're a guide for typical water. You should always take your sample results to a qualified health professional. And then, um, you know, they want to help you. They don't, uh, they're not trying to condemn your well or do any of those things, and they can't. You know, there's, um, I know one place where um, they can condemn your well, and that's Rhode Island. They've passed a law that for a property transfer, the water has to be tested, and if it doesn't meet a standard, then you have to put, add treatment to fix it, or a building inspector can condemn the property. Um, that's the strictest law in the country. Um, there might, I think there's one county in New York State where they also do that at property transfer. Um, but otherwise, you know, like in Illinois, if you take your sample to a county health department, they will say, you know, your arsenic is well over the limit, and you really shouldn't drink this, and you shouldn't have your kids drinking it. Um, here's what you can do. You know, it's up to you. Some people swear. Uh, it, in the arsenic area in Illinois, I've done a lot of research, and there's people who are, I've drank this my whole life. I'm not about to change. It tastes great, blah, 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 blah. Um, but, yeah, I can't, no one can tell them to stop drinking their water or condemn their well, but they can recommend that this really isn't a good idea uh, for health reasons. So as far as treatment, um, you know, our class has all this, this information in it as well about, you know, different kinds of treatment, whether you have a softener or a filter, RO. Um, the message here is that if you have one of those things, you have to maintain it. Um, I actually had a guy from Minnesota Department of Health ask me not to put treatment in our class lessons, which Lessons 10 is all about treatment. He said he sees, when he's out in the field, more people who their treatment device has become the source of their contamination because they haven't maintained it. Um, it's got bacteria growing on it, or they haven't, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, water's going around uh, the membrane it's supposed to be going through because they haven't maintained it. So if you're going to add treatment, you need to understand what maintenance it has, what has to be replaced, and what those costs are, because if you don't do it, um, it could be causing you more problems than the original one. And so, um, you know, it's important uh, to do that. So, that's what I have for today as far as the, you know, the kind of the boilerplate of our um, Well Care 101. Um, the rest of the time we're going to spend answering questions, and as I mentioned, um, 
we had we got a lot of questions, many of them yesterday, and uh, we had a little snafu ourselves. We thought we sent out the email we always send out a few weeks in advance, and we didn't. And so many of you didn't know about this webinar until yesterday. So we got your questions yesterday. We Dan and I have been going through them uh, since then, and uh, so we do have answers for a number of those, but um, some we certainly uh, didn't get to. And if you have questions, looks like we've already got one from someone. Katie's monitoring uh, the chat box and the question box on your GoToWebinar uh, band or screen. And if you type them in there, she will, um, uh, we have, we share a Google Doc, a Google document, um, which I'll pull over and put in front of you whenever we get to that point at the end. And it says it's time permitting, uh, in our webinar is supposed to end at 2.30. Um, if we're here till later than that, for those of you that want to stay and have questions, we'll certainly stay and answer them. So um, where to sample and why? Um, we get this, this is another question, and the reason I show this, I show this almost every time because it's really important to understand. So it's, uh, there's two different types of water that you have, right? There's the water that's in the ground, that's the natural groundwater, and then there's the water that comes out of your kitchen tap, which is your drinking water they can be markedly different. And that's because the water in your house at your kitchen tap has been sitting in your pipes overnight. Um, you know, it, depending on the type of water, it may have went through a softener or a filter or an RO unit. All of those things change the water chemistry. So what our lab does and what Dan does is ask folks whenever they call and say, we wanna get a water sample. He finds out what their situation is, what kind of treatment they have, all that stuff and then typically sends two sets of bottles and ask them to collect one at an outside tap or out a spigot that's near the well that's before any kind of treatment let it run so that you're getting a quote groundwater sample and that helps me as a groundwater hydrologist understand what the natural groundwater quality is but it helps you too uh, to know those things and then the kitchen tap sample is representative of what your drinking water is and that's been through a treatment it's been sitting in your pipes all those sorts of things and again, as I said, they can be significantly different, and I'm going to show you an example. Um, so this is a sample of a well. So there's three, there's three different analysis here. The first one is the outside tap. And this is Muhammad, Illinois, which is only about 15 miles from here, and it's in the Muhammad Aquifer, which is a large sand and gravel aquifer that the city of Champaign that I get my water from too. So this well is like 235 feet deep in sand and gravel. And what I want to point out here is you can look down at the bottom on the right side and see the hardness is 351. Uh, the total dissolved solids is 406. Um, the other interesting things here are the pH is 8. And uh, look how high the on the left on the right side, excuse me, in the middle, the turbidity and color, those are pretty high values. So also on the left side near the top, it says sodium is 25.9. So uh, this person has a softener and a filter, and so after the softener and the filter, you can see if you go to the right side first, halfway down, the turbidity and the color have certainly gone way down. They're more clear. pH hasn't changed much. That's okay. The hardness, though, the softener is doing what it's supposed to do. The hardness went from 351 to 0.68, which is great. It means the softener is working like it's supposed to. He's using sodium chloride for his salt, regular softener salt. And so if you look at the sodium value on the upper left side, you'll see that went from 25 to 198. That's not a big deal for most of us, but if you're on a low sodium diet and you drink a lot of water, it could, could make a difference. So this person also has an RO unit, which you know a, um, a reverse osmosis membrane takes out most things. And so those little arrows uh, on the bottom left there, for every one of them that has an, an arrow pointing to the left, that means it's less than the detection limit for our equipment. Um, this is from our lab. And so after the RO unit, um, you can see there's mostly less thans, which means you know it's taken most everything out. The sodium's even down to 6.24. But the difference is if you look at the pH now, the pH is down to 6.23. We've taken out the things that buffer the water and keep it you know uh, more basic. And so now it's a little bit uh, on the acidic side. And that's not a big deal in Illinois because our groundwater is mostly between 7.5 uh, or higher in pH. But if you're in an area where water is already low pH, like in Virginia and the Piedmont Aquifer, they have pHs of their natural groundwater is like 5.5, which makes it more corrosive, or can, and it means that if you have lead pipes or lead solder or galvanized pipe, 
um, you're much more likely to leach things. Well, if you run it through an RO unit, you're also going to lower the pH more in, in all likelihood. So understanding those differences, if, if this person wouldn't have provided these three sets of bottles or samples, um, you know, we would have never figured all this stuff out. And it's, it's really interesting how it works and to help you understand your water system. Um, and, you know, this costs a little more money to do this, no doubt, because you have three sets of samples here. But the information you've gathered, and, you know, and Dan can help folks understand what these all mean, uh, is really invaluable to understanding your water supply. So that's what we recommend. Um, well maintenance. So what maintenance do I need to do yearly? How do I know if there are problems? So I want to mention that, you know, again, our class that we have, um, this webinar is not our private well class. Our private well class is a set of 10 lessons that you receive as a PDF, and they're mailed to you, emailed to you once a week, over 10 weeks once you sign up for the class. It's much more detailed and provides a lot more information than we can do today. And so there's a whole list of things that you should do. You inspect your well and your well cap, um, your vent tube, your gasket, all those things. Um, you know, I always use the example, I used to use uh, basically a road gear for our riding mower when I was mowing our yard. And if um, I ever hit a post or anything else, I just kept going. So if you have a well in your yard and you got a high schooler, um, you know, and you have PVC casing, you need to check it. Make sure that it's not been cracked um, or it's not leaning, where it's been, you know, hit with something, where it's bent and it's cracked below ground, all those sorts of things. And then sampling, again, is another major issue. Uh, and just understanding where your well's at and if you might have risk of flooding. So um, it's really all the common things I went through before, but there's a lot more detail um, if you go through our lessons. And in Lesson 5, it talks about that. So I got the, we got the question this time, how often should someone do preventative maintenance on their pump? Well, there's a number of ways I took this. One, did someone suggest they should do preventative maintenance on their pump? Um, oh, I apologize. I thought I had my phone off. Uh, I guess I don't. Um, so should, is someone recommending that? Because it's, it's not something we ever come across, really. So... We had to ask, or Katie actually asked, a uh, number of drillers around the country called them about how long should a pump last uh, a number of years ago. We, were, we, did, we asked that question, how much should a typical well cost, blah, blah, blah. Well, we got a variety of answers about that, about from 7 to 25 years for a pump. Um, and I'm not aware of anyone doing annual pump maintenance, unless it's a specialty pump, like for an irrigation well, or if it's a really old um, you know, piston pump, maybe because you have to oil it or those sorts of things. But pumps are sealed and meant to run a long time on their own, just like your sump. You don't go down and do maintenance on your sump if you have one um, every year. And in the case of a submersible pump, that means it's down in your well. That would mean you have to pull the pump every year to inspect it, which it's not recommended to open your well unless you absolutely have to. So, um, you know, I'm certainly interested in any of the feedback if someone has any about why you would want to do preventive maintenance on the pump, but I don't think that's really something you need to do. If your pump fails, it can be pulled and maybe it can be fixed. If not, you might have to replace it, but you usually just use a pump until it doesn't work anymore. And that's uh, not a great answer, but that's the way they're built and what they're for. I mean, they're, you know, they're solid. They're meant to, they're meant to take it. You know, we run into people, one of the guys I work with here, um, he has a pump that's in his basement because he's got shallow water, shallow groundwater, so he doesn't have to have a well down or a pump down in his well. And it's the original pump that was there from the 60s when the house was built. Um, he bought it, you know, 15 years ago, and it just failed. So he's used a pump for over 50 years, and you know, there's no new reason to change it, uh, or do anything because it just it just worked, and that's what they're meant to do. They're meant to be hardy. Um, as far as disinfecting your well, there are a number of questions about disinfecting my well. When should I do it? Um, how often? You know, how do I do that? So, you know, there's a lot of different resources out there that talk about how to disinfect your well. And uh, we went through probably 70 of those to come up with what we felt was the best one. And, uh, and it's the Minnesota Department of Health, this particular document. And you can get to this if you go to our website, privatewellclass.org, and go to the resources page. Um, there's resources for each of the 10 lessons, and under Lesson 10, Underwater Treatment, this document's one of them you can click on and download. Um, so you don't, there's a lot of things you need to do. You don't, you don't pump, uh, you don't disinfect your well on a schedule. You only disinfect it when you have to. And the only time you have to is if the well's been opened, it's recommended that you do that. 
and or anytime you've sampled and it shows bacteria, you don't, um, you know, I had a person in Northern Illinois tell me, well, my driller said just to pour uh, a cup of bleach down my well every month, it'd be fine. That's bad advice. And, um, you know, you, you don't open your well for anything if you don't need to. And you don't just pour straight bleach. Um, one reason is it's too concentrated. It's an oxidant. In a bedrock situation, it can release metals like arsenic or um, other things. And also, it's hard on components. If you have a pitless that's got rubber seals or there's rubber seals on your uh, pump, it can make those things go uh, bad a lot quicker and, and stop working because it makes them brittle. And so you mix it um, as we go through this. Uh, you know, that's got great documentation on how much to use. You mix it in a bucket. Um, you use unscented bleach, uh, all those things. And, um, you know, even tells you what might go wrong. Like sometimes when you disinfect your well, you take a sample afterward and you still have bacteria. Well, like it says here, there's a warning. There could be buildup. Um, and this is about scale, but it can also be that there's buildup of bacteria, iron bacteria, some other thing in your well, and it might take several times to get rid of uh, that stuff. So um, it's really important uh, to go through and follow these rules. And the reason this is such a great document is it does it step by step. It has pictures and diagrams and tables to make sure that it, you understand what you need to do. And even has information about what to do with your treatment equipment. Most of it is to look at the Water Quality Association website and find your specific equipment and what the manufacturer recommends. Um, but you know, it's, there's certain uh, things you need to recommend or you need to, uh, like, take it offline and make sure it's not going, uh, the chlorinated water's not going through that device or that sort of thing. You can bypass it. So, uh, but, yeah, you can go on our website and find that or contact us, and we can um, certainly uh, send you a copy as well. Uh, Dan, this one is for you. Okay. Uh, the question we had was uh, if our water sits for a long time and it turns a, uh, a strong yellow color. Uh, what causes the, this to happen, and is it dangerous? Um, in my experience, uh, and Steve and I talked about, a little bit about uh, other scenarios this morning, but uh, in my experience, uh, usually it's due to uh, iron in the water. So iron uh, is soluble in its plus two oxidation state, so you'll hear people talk about iron two or ferrous iron. Uh, and so, but when it gets pumped up and is exposed to air, then that iron can change oxidation state to iron three or iron uh, three plus uh, or ferric iron, and that generally falls out of solution as like iron hydroxide, or people will call it rust. Um, and it that is not generally considered harmful. Um, I don't want to you know exclude other things. Um, other things that can cause yellow tints, if it, if it settles out, it's probably an iron thing. If it's something that stays dissolved and, and it's always in there, around here at least we run into natural organic matter called tannins. Um, Steve, did you want to mention anything else? or? Um, we ran into a case where uh, I believe it was silica causing it. But, it, you know, it may have been the organic matter, now that I think about it, that was causing that. And, uh, and it was a community water supply where their water was kind of had a yellow tint to it. So, you know, you can always test, too, to make yeah. yourself a little in, in, feel safer about things. Sure. In, in any event, it, what, no matter what the cause, it, it uh, you know, if you're concerned about it, uh, or, you know, a lot of these things are regulated, or not regulated, but monitored uh, for aesthetic reasons. Like, iron is probably the most common question we get. Hey, I want to know how much iron's in it. Uh, or tannins or other things, but have your water tested. It's good advice that I think you'll hear a, a constant theme from Steve throughout this whole class. Okay. Um, so we've got a question. Are there any special precautions or tests for a well owner should conduct if there's oil and gas drilling or fracking under or near their well? So, you know, what I said here is this is really a slippery slope for us for advice. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on related to fracking around the country. Um, the things I do know, I know our state geological survey is involved uh, with a lot more of this and it was involved when Illinois passed the laws that they have related to fracking um, than we are. But um, what I do know is, you know, there's different chemicals used. Uh, it can vary from state to state. Some states have required certain things not be used. In some cases, even that information is confidential and you don't even know what they're using for the fracking fluid. And so, you know, the best thing you can do is, is find local and state information. So talk to your local and state health department 
Um, also, your state geological survey, and, and if you have a state USGS office in your state, talk to them and talk to the geologists in the oil and gas sections there and ask them what they recommend. They'll give you a good advice and they'll help you. So, and in some cases, I know um, I've seen where even the drilling company, the company who's doing uh, the oil and gas work, um, will sample wells within a certain distance, both before and after they're done. Um, you know, and not to discourage anyone, but I went to a talk once where um, a person with an energy company gave a presentation showing how different the chemistry was in a particular private well every hour. It was a very low flow well, which means every time a pump kicked on, the water level would drop 50 to 100 feet in the well, uh, even for just a you know a three gallon per minute pump. And that uh, that oxid that that having that air hit the rock, it's a bedrock well where it's open to the bedrock um, all the time, uh, makes the chemistry different because you start oxidizing things when air is involved. And so this person showed a graph that showed how different the sample was from hour to hour to hour, and it really made taking one sample seem useless. It wouldn't prove anything one way or the other. And so, you know, and that's just in this one particular place where it's a low flow well. But I, I think of that every time the word fracking comes up because um, if you, you know, some states have even rules on, uh, I think in Pennsylvania, if you want your sample to be defensible in court, you can't collect it yourself. Uh, either a certified lab has to do it or I don't remember all the rules there, but it, you know, there's a lot of things that go along with fracking because it's such a political and hot button topic um, that you really need to find out what's going on in your area for that. We really, um, you know, other than you need to be aware, and if it's going on near you, then, yeah, you should find out what you can. So, um, and if someone has other thoughts on that, please email us. Um, you know, we'd be glad to, uh, to talk about it more. All right, Dan, this one's for you. Okay. Uh, sometimes we get questions about uh, what's a good home water test kit. Like you can buy some uh, quick uh, strips or solutions at like a hardware store. And uh, instead of like trying to, you know, narrow it down to one kit, I just had general advice for things to look for if you're going to do something like, like that yourself. Um, uh, one thing uh, you want to be sure to look for are units. And Steve talked about units earlier. Uh, know the difference between parts per million and parts per billion. Those are the commonly used terms, but from the scientific standpoint, you'll often see micrograms per liter or milligrams per liter. Um, basically, parts per million is the same thing as milligrams per liter, and parts per billion is the same thing as micrograms per liter, and uh, they're a thousand apart. So uh, there's a, in one milligram per liter, there's a thousand micrograms per liter. Uh, so when you see the real results, like if you get nitrate or copper or something like that, uh, look, if you look at the regulation and it says it's, like, let's say copper, for instance, it's 1,300 parts per billion, but your test strip might show uh, units of parts per million. So if you see, like, five parts per million of copper, you might say, hey, that's less than 1,300, but uh, that'll be equivalent of 5,000 uh, parts per billion. So um, make sure you understand the units that, and what your test is testing for. Also, you know, sometimes I've looked at, these test strips and I'll see advertising words that'll uh, make me suspicious and I, I don't want to say anything is wrong but if you see something that generically says pesticides uh, look a little closer it probably just means maybe a common pesticide in the in the country it's not going to just be a test for all pesticides um, and the same thing if you see the words that says EPA and it seems they seem to be using it to say uh, this is accepted by the EPA it's the, look at the wording carefully. It probably says they're going to suggest EPA filtration or something like that. It doesn't necessarily mean anything with the, regards to the quality of the test. So uh, just watch for those kind of things. Uh, follow the instructions closely. Sometimes uh, I know in distilled water, sometimes it'll show up a, a little bit funny on tests. Uh, you might have to wait 30 seconds, uh, things like that. So follow the instructions carefully. And uh, in all cases on these quick tests, they're probably somewhat reliable, but uh, if there's anything you're questioning, um, get your water tested uh, by a standard lab that um, uses standard equipment. Uh, sometimes you'll read things, and I've experienced it myself, where there'll be false positives or false negatives on some of the test kits. 
Yeah, and I would add, um, you know, it, sometimes you get what you pay for, right? Sure. So, yeah. Um, you know, you just need to be sure and. They're not bad, but if you're trying to substitute uh, a, a pack of 50 tests that cost you 10 bucks, you know, uh, and you're trying to substitute one of those for a $200 test, yeah, I would say you get what you pay for. But, you know, they can be good for the, for certain uses, but, yeah. yeah. All right. All right, this is for you as well. We, we often get a uh, question about uh, rotten egg smell or... Um, this in our public service lab and in, in this class, uh, typically uh, I see that that's um, generally uh, attributed to sulfur uh, reducing bacteria, and often the solution is chlorination. Um, the The idea here is that it's going to kill the bacteria, uh, and um, then it won't be there to uh, reduce the uh, sulfate or sulfur to the hydrogen sulfide, which is the cause. Um, if you do chlorinate, it will also probably oxidize any uh, hydrogen sulfide that's present. Um, if you have a, a continuous source, like if it's coming in from the aquifer and you have this, you just you can chlorinate. That's just going to take care of your local well components, maybe the you know the screen. And it, assuming you chlorinate like the instructions, you can take care of all your in, indoor plumbing. Um, it's still not going to spread out like much beyond your well, I wouldn't think. Uh, so if, it, if it's coming in constantly, you may need to add some type of continuous chlorination to take care of it. And sometimes, uh, some people have told me before uh, that uh, like the bacteria can grow in layers. So once you chlorinate once, it might slough off the first layer of cells or in crevices, things like that. Like not everything in your system is just a flat surface. So you might need to uh, treat more than once. I had a health department guy tell me it took uh, one customer like seven tries before he could get rid of the some of the causes. And that's just bad luck. Yeah, yeah. But it is does happen. Okay. Uh, it, it looks like a similar question. Uh, smells in the hot water heaters. Um, uh, you know, we've seen that often associated with bacteria also, and, and they talk about disinfection of the water heater. Uh, generally, uh, the bacteria or chemical reactions happen at this uh, anode rod. It's a it's it's a sacrificial rod. Um, I've seen some suggestions where people can uh, use chlorine or other things, other you know, like turning up the temperature, uh, peroxide, uh, ways to basically disinfect your hot water heater. Um, if you do turn the temperature up, uh, turn it back down so you don't scald yourself. Um, some uh, times you'll see people suggest uh, taking out the anode rod completely. Uh, that's not really a good idea because it's there intentionally to, to be sacrificial uh, so that your tank doesn't corrode or parts of your tank don't corrode. They, generally, hot water heaters are glass lined, but they still say there are some connections that um, uh, need to be protected. Um, oh, yes, uh, some other things I, I had seen here. Uh, softeners, uh, sometimes people will think softeners can take out a lot of stuff, but they won't do anything for smells generally. And Dan, since we're on this topic, uh, Katie just put up a question uh, that someone asked, said, I, I got the sulfur smell after chlorinating the well. Why? Uh, not before? I have not heard that before because my guess was that the chlorine would oxidize it and get rid of it. Um, so I'd have to, I, I don't really know. I'd have to uh, see what yeah. others, look for other advice on that. Um, yeah. The only thing I could think of is that maybe when you chlorinate, you could knock stuff loose in your well, um, and and cause you know something unexpected uh, to happen. Like if you knock a, a layer of um, iron off or something that's been protecting, uh, maybe you're exposing a different surface of rock. Maybe you're exposing a new mineral, um, and then over time, um, that can you know start to be converted to hydrogen sulfide, something like that. Sure. All right. Uh, this is for you too. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a, a pretty common question. You know, uh, somebody has a problem with hard water. Either they have uh, some scale buildup, like in hot water heaters, or they have just uh, hard water deposits. Um, anyway, uh, generally, it's not con hard water is not considered a health risk, uh, but it is um, an aesthetic issue often. Uh, it's on the secondary maximum contaminant list. 
Um, and the most common treatment is a water softener. Uh, these actually will take out the calcium and magnesium through an uh, ion exchange process, and they'll exchange those for sodium. Some other, anything, uh, many things that are uh, cations or positively charged uh, elements, they'll be taken out uh, too. Uh, so you'll see reduction in a lot of metals, and basically you'll see sodium increase. Um, generally what should, what's going to happen is your calcium and magnesium are going to drop down to almost zero and your sodium is going to increase to maybe, depending on how your hard your water is, but around here we, we see a couple hundred parts per million, maybe one to three hundred parts per million increase. But you can get a good estimate of how much your sodium is going to increase by uh, taking the hardness value you have and uh, expressed as parts per million calcium carbonate. That's a pretty common unit. Uh, the other unit that's common is grains per gallon, but the, the, there's a, uh, the conversion factor is 17, so you multiply uh, grains per gallon by 17 to get parts per million of hardness uh, as uh, calcium carbonate. Um, just cut it in half is approximately, and that'll give you how much sodium it's going to increase. Um, for people on low sodium diets, it might be a concern. Uh, mostly there I want to, you know, my disclaimer is, you know, talk to your doctor about that. Uh, they do make potassium chloride available. Um, I haven't shopped for, for a while, but it used to be about four times more expensive. So instead of like five bucks a bag, it might cost 20 bucks a bag. So I, I suspect that's the big reason people don't use that. But um, yeah, I guess I would conclude with mentioning that it's not really a, a health risk. I think I said that already. But uh, anyway, I think that yeah. covers it. Well, and that reminds me, um, Dan is, um, lives this too because he has his own well. So it's kind of cool in that respect, the things he's gone through on his own house uh, that are related. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a softener and it's... Uh, uh, you know, another question, I, I guess I didn't point it out here, but iron is, I think I mentioned before, it's one of our biggest questions, but um, most softeners do take iron out too, so you wouldn't necessarily have to get a, a iron filter and a softener. I know sometimes water treatment can be expensive, but if you get a good water softener, I would suspect it could do a pretty good job of handling iron. Look for a softener that's, uh, uh, at least the, the dealer I work with, uh, he's got softeners that are made for like city water that doesn't have too much stuff in it and then well water, they, they wash out the mechanisms a little bit differently. And so if you get a good softener that's meant for well water and a high level of iron, you, you can probably uh, be good with just a softener. All right. Uh, so we had a question about Giardia. And uh, so basically this, here's the question. I periodically field questions from people who test and find E. coli. Uh, and concerned about Giardia in their wells, which I don't believe would be treated with by shock chlorination. Can you discuss how this likely this is um, and what we advise them? Well, uh, this falls into the health professional realm, uh, realm to us, uh, for me anyway. And so Dan looked this up uh, and found uh, this website. And I think Katie's going to post it in the chat box if you want to uh, cut and paste it um, for Giardia. But uh, it's really handy this website that CDC has it's part of their healthy water program and um, for private wells and they have for related pages I've you can see on the far right there's a plus sign there in gray on that related pages there's a if you click on that it gives you a whole list of things that there's information for besides Giardia um, but this page um, this is the front half of it or the top half of it it talks about you know what it is and how it gets into water and then as you move down um, how do you find out if it's in there you know you need to test obviously and then if you do have it what do you do well it's turns out it's a cyst uh, and so it's big enough to be pulled with a one micron filter so um, that information is all on CDC's website and we just gave you the link and uh, Dan did legwork to find that um, and you know, you can do the same thing for a number of constituents. Either you'll find something on CDC's page or the US EPA's page, um, something like that. So um, you can always contact us as well, and we can find this information like, like Dan did for this today. So A good idea putting that up, Steve, with the, uh, you know, the, mentioning that CDC has other pages. That, uh, yeah. I should have thought oh, yeah. of that. No, that's pretty cool. So um, that's the questions for now. I'm going to talk a little bit about our private well class, and then we'll get to the questions that have been asked uh, from today. So um, as I mentioned, it's a series of 10 lessons. You go to our webpage and uh, you click on learn by email and uh, you sign up with your email address. I'm getting ahead of myself. And these webinars really are meant to ask to provide specific information um, and give you a chance to ask questions. So 
uh, the, the private well class curriculum, if you will, or the 10 lessons have much more information, they're much more detailed, they have a lot of figures and examples and things like that. Um, so you click on enroll in class on the front page and it takes you here. You sign up with your email address, your first name, and where do you live, and that really helps us because one of the things that we try to show RCAP and EPA is that we have people taking this from all over the country, and we do, actually from many countries that they get on here and, and have signed up for our class as well. So um, the where do you live really just is a state drop down and so that we can uh, track, you know, which states are we doing a better job of getting information out in and things like that. And uh, yeah, it just sends you an email once a week for 10 weeks. So the way this is set up, um, it sends you an email and it's got a link to the PDF. And then um, every week at the same time, you'll get another one. And it's lesson two, lesson three. And for every person in our evaluation that says, well, once a week is too often, uh, we have another person that says once a week is too, uh, too long. And so we've left it that way because really it's been pretty much for people who actually have a, a viewpoint on that, it's, it's been pretty split. So um, that's what we're going to stick with. I'm doing this for about five years now. This is the front page. I guess I got the card ahead of the horse here. Um, you click on learn by email and it takes you to that page we were just at. Um, we also have a lot of information available. We have podcasts and videos, and up at the top you can go to the resource library, the webinars and events, and I'll go through a few things really quick. If you go to resource library, I mentioned for each of the 10 lessons, there's a series of other documents that reinforce the material that's there. And so like for lesson one, it's about the science of groundwater, how water moves to the ground, um, you know, what it is, all that sort of stuff. You can click on any of these and read more. And, um, you know, I particularly I try to mention the, the two, the third and fourth bullet there under lesson one uh, by Lyle Raymond. These were done in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, he was at Cornell. And uh, they're really well done from the standpoint of they're really easy to understand. He had a great way of writing things such that uh, it makes it really clear. And I use several of his figures in our lessons because of that. So, um, but there's, you know, as you go through, there's actually for all 10 lessons, there are other materials if you want to read up or learn more than what we put in our lessons, um, just to give you more information. We do webinars like the one we're on today every month. Sometimes we do topic spe specific ones. Uh, we've done this lead webinar twice. We did it once in 2016 and again in uh, last August. We brought in an expert uh, from Virginia Tech who knows a lot about lead and private wells uh, to do a lot of the presentation and uh, we covered information from other sources, but um, we also created a web page after this was done. And so you can go to our website and it's privatewellclass.org slash lead, and it'll take you to a, a resource page that has links like to CDC and EPA and other resources about, you know, what to do if you have lead pipes or if you, your house is a certain age, you know, if it's uh, really anything before 2014, uh, what was considered lead-free wasn't really lead-free, and in some cases, uh, research is showing that um, even a little bit of lead solder uh, can have a significant impact on the amount of lead if your water's corrosive. And so those are the things you need to know. And, and so there's videos like this. Uh, we've, you know, this shows 45 uh, recordings. There's you know, been a few more since I made this screenshot, but... Uh, um, there's a lot of good information in those, and at the end of every one, we answer questions like we just did. So we also have a series of training videos, these short um, four to six minutes about, you know, this one's about why does my well keep losing pressure, you know, how does my pressure tank work, um, what do I do if I share a well, um, you know, what is the sand and gravel aquifer, things like that, that are just about one topic, and it's interesting because of this uh, video about pressure or about pressure tanks is our by far most popular. Um, I think the, it's a different video that's called How Does My Pressure Tank Work? has had uh, in three years well over 200,000 hits. And that tells us that a lot of well owners have pressure problems and there's not a lot of good information out there about how your pressure tank works and what you can do to try to, you know, to, to tweak that to make it work properly or to provide better pressure. So, uh, you know, they're just meant to be helpful and help you understand the basics of how your system works. And, you know, in the end, the goal of our program is to help you understand as a well owner why your well is important, why you need to understand how it works. You can't just, you know, hey, I got water today. You might not tomorrow. And, uh, you know, you need to know why. 
and or my your electric bill goes way up because you know all of a sudden your pump's kicking on and off uh, frequently. Well, why is that happening? There's there's a reason, and you need to take care of it. And most importantly, how to protect themselves from risks, you know, from contaminated water. And so um, this class as a whole helps you learn enough basics about your well that you can ask better questions when you go talk to a health professional or a state, you know, geological survey or some of those folks um, or DNR or whatever agency it may be in your state or your local health department and also um, help you understand, you know, enough about your well to know what problems you might have and what things you might need to fix. So it's really um, what we want people to learn by taking the class is that, you know, you need to have your well log and know where your water's coming from. So you need to know how deep your well is, what your pump set is, how much screen you have, if you have a screen, and how much casing you have. Um, you should understand the local geology and understand if there might be water quality so, uh, issues associated with that, natural occurring arsenic or, you know, beryllium. I'll bring that up again. And then, again, like I said, it helps you understand um, what questions to ask and also tells you where your local sources of information might be. Um, you know, we can't answer every well owner's question in the country, um, but if we can help you learn um, what you don't know and need to know, then you can find those local sources and, and they're more than willing to help you. And lastly, you know, again, it's about sampling your well and knowing what you're drinking. And it's just peace of mind. You know, many times your sample comes back fine and uh, folks use their well and have for, you know, for a long time and it's always been good. But if you don't sample, you don't know and things can change. And so it's important to do that. Um, so that's what we had today. I'm going to pull this down and we have a couple questions. I think one of them we may have answered. Um, but I'm going to pull this up and make it larger real quick. Okay. So um, I think we answered the first question. Uh, when do you shock chlorinate the well and why? Uh, that was the, the part about, the, you know, the the Minnesota Department of Health disinfection guide that we presented. Um, you shouldn't shock your well unless you really need to, and that means you've tested and it's uh, got bacteria in it. Um, you know, some people, and we, we recommend if you open the well up anytime you've opened up the cap, uh, that you should probably chlorinate it. But some people will uh, test it first, and, you know, that's also if you're testing it to see if it's got bacteria in it, then you'll know. Um, before you go to the trouble of chlorinating. And the thing about shock chlorination is you hear all these different approaches to doing that. If you don't um, mix the right amount of uh, chlorine so that you've got the right amount in your well, and then you don't run it through every line, every toilet, every shower, every faucet, and let it sit overnight so that that chlorine can actually kill whatever bacteria might be in your system, then you haven't shock chlorinated your well the right way. I, I didn't say that earlier. I probably should have. But, you know, there's a right approach, and that is uh, you need to understand that the water needs to sit, that chlorinated water needs to sit in all the lines, every line. And then once you've done that, uh, then you run them all again until you don't smell it anymore, and uh, you should be back to what you had before, and you're just pumping that to waste. So, um, and the second question here, uh, would moving pastured cattle over the septic drain field uh, impact compaction enough to be detrimental? You know, Probably not, but, you know, uh, it, it all depends uh, how well your septic field is, was installed, how deep it is. Um, you know, I know I've certainly seen bulls that were close to 2,000 pounds. That's a lot to be on four hooves. That's 500 pounds of pressure on each spot. And if it, uh, you know, it, it probably won't affect anything. But, um, yeah, it's probably better not to. Is a bottom line, but we see all the time where people put a, you know, they put gravel over where their drain field is, and they're running tractors and uh, grain trucks and other things, and because it's handy, it's you know maybe buy a grain bin or whatever. Um, but doing those things, uh, you're compacting the soil, and it, it also depends on your soil type, um, how compact, how compactable is it. So there's uh, there's a lot of caveats there, I guess, but um, you know it kind of depends on your situation. It's just not a good idea. And that's why we recommend that you keep that free of anything. So um, I think that's all the questions we have. It's 2.30, so we're right on time. Um, I appreciate everyone sticking around. And uh, Dan and Katie, thank you for all your help. 
And everyone, um, let us know if you have any other questions. You can always email us at info at privatewellclass.org. And uh, thanks for attending.